Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so, a very warm welcome to you for uh, uh, all to, for tonight's discussion of a, a calibration of VAR models with overlapping data by the Extreme Events Working Party. Uh, so, th this is a, a, the latest in a series of papers by the Extreme Events Working Party. It seems to have been going for 10 or more years, I, I think. Uh, although our, our speaker tonight, Gorang, said he would, he'd been a member for maybe just the last two or three years. Um, and, and so there, uh, but it, it's produced a number of papers, and, uh, and therefore I think it must be one of the most productive uh, working parties that the profession has had, certainly in recent years, including uh, uh, producing papers for sessional meetings, which is all, all the good thing. Um, in the paper, the authors uh, compare the different ways in which one can obtain an estimate of the, the whole of the distribution of a quantity of interest with a one-year time horizon in particular, clearly with solvency two in mind. And then once a distribution has been found, then you can pick off the 99.5% value at risk, which is where the VAR comes from in the title of the paper. The starting point for this is a set of data, as you need for any bit of statistical modelling. And the challenge is that this data set might not go back many years, and so simple approaches uh, to identifying the one year ahead distribution are susceptible to significant levels of sampling variation or parameter estimation error. Uh, this then sets a challenge. Is there a clever way to exploit the higher frequency data, such as monthly, uh, to get an improved estimate of the one year ahead distribution. So this leads to the use of overlapping data, which is one of the main topics of tonight's paper. The authors discuss the different ways that overlapping data can be used uh, and compare the pros and cons of each. Uh, the authors also discuss what I would describe as uh, full stochastic modeling of, say, monthly data, and this is then straightforward to generate forecasts of one-year returns, etc. But full modelling has its own strengths and weaknesses, which the authors also discuss. Uh, so with that overview, I'd now like to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, uh, Gorang Mehta, uh, a member of the Working Party and one of the authors of the paper. Gorang is a consulting actuary and currently works for EVA Actuarial and Accounting Consultants Limited. He works as a subject matter expert on market risks and internal model, uh, model methodology and risk scenario generators. He is qualified as a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries and holds a financial risk manager qualification from GAR. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, hand over to you. Go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Gaurang Mehta, and I'm going to be speaking on the journey that we have taken um, for this particular paper. Uh, initial results of this paper were presented in the live conference last year, uh, in 2017, last last year, um, in Birmingham. And further progress we made on uh, various areas, and this is an updated uh, presentation of that. Um, <clears throat> the agenda for today is, first I'll describe you the problem statement with which we started uh, doing further work on this idea of uh, overlapping data and treatment of overlapping data. After that, we'll give you the key conclusions that we have drawn from our analysis uh, to start with, to give you the context of what we are going to be, um, the final conclusions of it. Then we'll talk about the estimation, cumulant estimation, and how and why we have used them. The pros and cons of overlapping versus non-overlapping data. The simulation studies that we have carried out and what conclusions we have drawn from simulation studies. We also explored the areas where we can adjust the standard statistical tests that are used for calibration purposes um, and retrofit them for overlapping data uh, and what conclusions we are getting from that. And as uh, the chair said, what are the, is there any smarter way of exploiting the annual data uh, to ensure that um, we can get more information out of it and a stable <coughs> calibration out of it? So the alternatives and solutions to overlapping data we have uh, tried and um, explored. So what is the problem statement that we are trying to work out? So 
Many of you might be involved in solvency two type calibrations. Solvency two regulation prescribes that you should have a calibration that is sufficient enough for a one in 200 year event over one year period or over a longer period, but the similar level of strength is required. So let's say in the UK, we believe most of the firms have adopted one year VAR approach where they're trying to estimate the calibrations um, which are capable enough to produce a one in 200 year event on a marginal basis. Now, just to give you an idea of the problem statement, to do that level of uh, statistically credible calibration, we need at least 200 years worth of data, which we do not have in most of the market risks. Forget about insurance risk calibrations. So insufficiency of the data is at the core of this problem. <clears throat> and therefore, the general market practice that most of the calibrators have used is to use overlapping data. Um, to give you an idea about overlapping data, when you are calculating the annual change in overlapping data, 11 months are in common. So the time series for 11 months is virtually the same. Only two mo one month differs at every time step. Therefore, the key questions or the dilemmas that any calibrator faces is that, what should I do? Shall I use more relevant data or shall I use for longer historical data? Now, the key problem is that when you go for longer series or longer historical data, that data is no longer relevant to the current context or the time frame. For example, the key example I would give you is um, equity data, for example. The equity data is available in, from 1600s from GPD, you know, global financial data series. So you can get it from 1600s for FTSE at least. But then the market constituents were different. The, the structure of the market was different. Industries were different. And therefore, in the current context, it is no longer relevant. So you need to make a choice whether to go for a relevant data, which is shorter, or a longer data, which is not relevant. And um, it is a choice, and there's no hard and fast rules we are setting, but most probably we believe that more relevant data is being used or retrofitted. You know, even if firms have used longer data, since they've retrofitted their stresses to make sure that relevant data is used. Once you have decided what data you want to go for, the next question comes is whether you, will you use overlapping data or non-overlapping data? Overlapping data certainly gives you more data points and therefore uh, more data to play with. And as a calibrator, you will always like more data to play with rather than uh, less data. Also, it, it, it does help in stability of the calibration in terms of justifying it to line two and um, external auditors and things like that. And therefore, let's say if you have used overlapping time series, um, then definitely you are introducing autocorrelation in your time series and other problems that, for example, your data is no longer IID. What can you do about it? Can we solve that problem? Um, what can we do some adjustment to our statistical testing, for example, hypothesis testing, uh, where we are checking our goodness of fit tests? Uh, can, we, can we make those adjustments? And what alternatives can we explore? Can we explore some statistically more advanced, for example, temporal aggregation type of approach? Can we use it? to make sure that we, although we use high frequency data, but can we convert them into low frequency data and use it? And what are its implications for our validation of the results in terms of the mean squared error for the estimate that we are trying to achieve or the bias for, for the estimates that we are trying to achieve? <clears throat> the key conclusions are, that are, I will just summarize in here and we'll look at in the final conclusions as well, that Distribution fitting and use of cumulants is widely used in the industry. A lot of people use method of moments, um, but a lot of people use cumulants as well and then convert into method of moments to fit the data. We believe um, maximum likelihood estimate is a better approach, uh, but within even the working party, the views sometimes differ. Some calibrators believe that method of moments is superior for certain uh, range of distributions. Um, the key pros of using overlapping data is that you have more number of data points and stability of the calibration. At the same time, there is no problem of window selection for overlapping data. For non-overlapping -over non data, certainly this is IID and therefore the standard, standard statistical tests 
are all valid. But then there's a window selection problem uh, as well for non-overlapping data. And the two possible solutions for correction of the um, bias in the data of overlapping data is that the one that the both we have tried is Nelkan and Sun, another is the Cochran um, adjustment we have tried. We can also alternatively use temporal aggregation or analyzation processes to avoid the whole problem of uh, overlapping data. But although they are useful, they have their own limitations um, in terms of they make the entire calibration process more complex, which is already a complex process. Uh, it's very hard to communicate to senior stakeholders, uh, where we are trying to communicate it without any formulas. Um, and adjustments to standard statistical tests are also difficult to maintain. So all these processes on alternatives that we are describing here, they are good as a technical discussion, but when you are in a BAU work frame where your calibrations have to be done within less than three months' time, approved by the board, and things like that, it is very hard to maintain these processes where you're changing your, your hypothesis testing approaches, your calibration approaches, and justifying all at the same time. So let's start with cumulants. Um, we used cumulants to do our simulation study to analyze the bias and the variance um, for both overlapping and non-overlapping data. They are very similar to moments, at, le at least the first three mo moments are same as the up to the third cumulant. The fourth cumulant slightly differs uh, from the central moment, but virtually first three are the same. And it's not difficult to convert the fourth moment and alternatively to a cumulant. The cumulants have very nice properties because they are random variables and therefore additivity um, and independence is achieved very easily. Therefore, we used uh, cumulants to do our simulation study. Now, <clears throat> as I said to you, there are two standard approaches to fit the distribution. One is method of moments or the cumulants approach. And the second one is maximum likelihood estimation approach. We believe MLE approach is more statistically uh, stronger um, and therefore a preferred approach. In terms of analyzing the distributions, generally, at least in the ICAS regime, we were interested in the points, you know, one in 100 point, one in 200 point. Whereas the emphasis has moved in, in solvency to for entire risk distribution. So we are interested in the body of the distribution as well as in the tail of the distribution. And therefore, not only the first two moments, but the skewness and kurtosis are equally important uh, uh, to understand and to make sure that we are, we are getting them correct at all times. Now, <clears throat> overlapping data certainly has more data points and um, therefore more data points and there is no need to select a window. And I'll, I'll describe to you this problem of window selection. Now, for example, let's say you are, if you remember 1974-75 oil, oil shock event, that happened in a, over a span of just four to five month period. And let's say if you analyze only January to January data on a non-overlapping time series, you might miss the oil shock event and the stress can vary by 10% plus or minus. But when you are using overlapping data, all the information is used in the data set. And therefore, you are calculating changes from January to January, February to February, and there is no way you can miss any event that has persisted more than a month, which is a very important feature of the data where you are trying to capture certain extreme events that have happened over a period of very, sh very, sh very short time. And therefore, this whole expert judgments about window selection that is there in, in, in case of non-overlapping data is gone if you are using overlapping data. And that is very important, particularly for credit risk, where the 2000 event, 2008 event is the only practical event that we have observed in the data. The 1932 uh, crisis was a default crisis, not a spread crisis. But the 2008 crisis was a spread crisis, and that is the only crisis that is there in the data. And therefore, it is very important uh, to use, to make sure that the window selection problem is not there. And overlapping data helps with that. In terms of disadvantages, <clears throat> as I said, 11 months are common in overlapping data, and therefore you can say they are autocorrelated and they are biased as well. And we have observed the bias in the data as well um, when you're using overlapping data. 
and the standard statistical tests are no longer valid when you are using uh, overlapping data. And therefore, either you, there are only two options, either you correct or adjust your standard statistical tests, or you just use them as indicators and not as a decision-making test, whether a dist particular distribution that you have fitted passes or fails, and use other, st other statistics to accept or reject a distribution. Um, <clears throat> non overlapping data on the other side, you, you are directly calculating the annual changes, so there is no need. Uh, it directly looks at the one-year VAR framework, and theoretically it is more accurate. Estimates are biased in both the cases, whether you use overlapping data or non-overlapping data. But in the main problem <coughs> is that the, there is not enough data to do a credible or statistically stable non-overlapping data-based calibration. And every new data point that you add, which is always only one data point every year, can change the calibration year on year significantly depending on what time frame you are selecting, what window you are selecting, and um, depending on whether the event, how critical is that event for the entire risk distribution. And you're using not the full information from the data, and therefore information missing is possible from the existing data. So you're not utilizing the entire data set to its core. <clears throat> now the bias correction, I think we have tried three of them. One is Basel's uh, bias correction, just you divide by n minus one. There are two other adjustments that are proposed by Cochran and one is by Nilkan and Sun. Uh, we have tried all three of them for correction of the data and give very similar result actually. But none of these bias corrections will remove um, arbitrary dependence, for example, mean reversion approaches or mean reversion characteristic of the data. They will not remove that type of bias. It can remove only statistical bias that is there in the data. When you are applying any bias correction methods, no matter uh, which bias correction methods you apply, we, what we observed is that it increases the variance of the time series. Um, and when it increases the variance of the time series, the stresses that you get overestimate the, the actual event and therefore the stresses will be higher when you apply these sort of corrections. Now, we can argue whether it is a correct approach or not a correct approach, but um, generally that is the behavior that we have seen. In terms of simulation study, I think we, we did simulation study on mainly four processes, uh, Brownian process, um, normal inverse Gaussian or NIG process, on the Garch process and on the Arima process. And what we found is that the Brownian motion and normal inverse Gaussian process or stable Levy process give very similar results. And therefore only one is presented in here. And Arima and Garch are slightly different in terms of the results. The methodology of simulation uh, study is, this was described in the ISATS model paper where I'll give you a brief overview of how we have done it. So you have a known distribution, so you select any known distribution or process, for example, Brownian process, for example, normal 0, 1 process or Garch 1, 1 process or any process you select. <coughs> you perform um, arbitrary simulations uh, of the data. From the arbitrary simulated data, monthly data, you calculate the overlapping and non-overlapping time series that you are interested in. And based on that, you calculate all the four cumulants of the data and then calculate the bias and the variance with the true values that you know from the start and, and see which one is giving you a better result. And you, you do, the, do this for a number of years and over a number of um, time periods. So we have repeated this for 1,000 samples and for up to 50 years, uh, the same process. So you take n years of monthly simulated data calculate the annual or no, no, no overlapping and non-overlapping time series and calculate the first four cumulants and compare for the bias and MSC um, for both of them. Now, the first chart is very important to understand and then I think you will follow them very quickly. The first chart on the left-hand side is the bias chart where you can see that both, whether you use overlapping data or non-overlapping data, the bias is there in the initial years, but as the number of, number of years of data goes up, the bias is more or less gone from the data. Similarly, for the first cumulant, the mean squared error is also uh, very similar whether we use overlapping data or non-overlapping data. <coughs> 
Um, although you, you can see here that non-overlapping data MFC is slightly or marginally lower than the overlapping data. But for a calibration purpose, first cumulant is not that important because generally you zero as the time series with a zero mean before you do the calibration. And what is the most important cumulant is the second cumulant, uh, which, which determines in most cases the value of the stress, particularly at 99.5th percentile, which you are interested in. Now, looking at the second cumulant charts, uh, and we have tried um, Nelkan, Kocharan, and Basel uh, corrections for the biases. And you can say that the, the time series in its original form, both whether it's overlapping or non-overlapping data, both have biases. And correcting the bias leads to virtually zero bias and proper time series. So it works for second cumulant only for the bias correction. Definitely, it, it, those corrections work. That is the first thing. Now, when we compare to the mean squared error, you can see that there is a considerable difference between the MSC for overlapping, uh, overlapping and non-overlapping data. And overlapping data MSC is lower than non-overlapping non data MSC, which tells you that it, the using overlapping data is closer to the known answer or the correct answer. Now, that was one of the key conclusions that we drew out of this. And this is similar to all the four processes that we have tried, whether it is a Garch process, a Rima process, normal inverse Gaussian process, or Brownian motion process. The third cumulant, again, it's a central moment, um, very close to skewness. You can see that both overlapping and overlapping data, without doing any sort of correction for the bias for the third cumulant, they have bias in the data. But more or less, they both are in the same directions, so it doesn't matter materially. The key important factor again here is the MSC value. Again, for overlapping data, the MSC is considerably lower. Uh, and therefore, uh, use of overlapping data again is closer to the right answer. That's what we have found. Finally, the fourth uh, cumulant in the Brownian process. Um, bias is there. As you increase the length of the data, it reduces, but in particularly when the data is less than 10 or 15 years worth, the problem is severe problem for the bias in the fourth cumulant. Again, overlapping data has a lower mean squared error and therefore closer to the right answer here for the Brownian, Brownian process. Now, similar conclusions are there for the Garge process other than the third cumulant. You can say the bias goes away for the first cumulant as you increase the number of years of data. And uh, non-overlapping data MSC is slightly better, particularly for uh, earlier years. Same conclusion uh, here as well that um, bias corrections sometimes work, sometimes do not, even for the second unit when the process is complex. So here you can say that they are overestimating the biases when you apply bias corrections. Again, overlapping data MSC is lower even for complex process like Garch processes as compared to non-overlapping data. Similar conclusions, whether it is a, a Brownian motion process or this process, the third cumulant MSC is lower for overlapping data in comparison to non-overlapping data. Even the bias is slightly lower over the entire time period, you can see for overlapping data periods. Now, the fourth cumulant uh, values differ because in the Garch process, you know, if they are not ergotic, um, it can blow uh, very widely, and therefore the results may or may not be reliable. So we have tried ourselves to uh, reduce them to ergotic Garch processes, and what we are seeing is that even for the fourth cumulant, using no, uh, annual overlapping data is more helpful, we believe, than using non-overlapping time series. So the same, I think I've summarized the conclusions while I was explaining with the charts that the bias corrections do work, um, but not always and for all the processes. Um, we only tried second cumulant bias corrections. Bias corrections are available for the third and the fourth cumulants as well, but we have not included in our studies. Um, applying bias corrections, we have observed that generally increases the variance and therefore the stresses. And bias corrections do not work for, uh, you know, mean reversion processes or, or which are arbitrary. And 
ARIMA, ARIMA model results are very similar to normal inverse Gaussian process and um, Brownian motion processes, so they are not repeated in here. Um, generally, the bias correction errors, even for gauge processes, leads to higher stresses overall. That's what we have observed. In terms of, um, then, the second alternative that we tried was, can we correct the standard statistical tests uh, which can be used uh, if we are using overlapping data? Because the standard statistical, statistical tests, such as kolmogorov smirnov test, assumes that the data periods are IID. And um, the, the distribution is a known distribution. So those sort of uh, uh, theoretically very sound assumptions uh, it makes before it starts doing the testing. But when we are facing the actual problem, um, the data is overlapping and therefore the IID assumption itself is not valid. So there's a standard uh, correction available. Lilifer's adjustment is available for kolmogorov smirnov That is what we have tried here uh, to implement. And it is based on something called as KS distance, which is the largest distance between your fitted and empirical data that you calculate and the entire tests is based on that, this KS distance. The steps, I think they are more technical uh, to, to describe here, they are there in the paper, but essentially you, you, you fit any known distribution to start with, you simulate the data from a known distribution for a number of times on a random trials, and then based on that, um, you, the simulated data, you refit those uh, standard distributions to it and calculate the KS distances derive the distribution of the KS distances and with the final distribution that you are fitting to it, uh, if it is higher than the KS distance at 95% confidence interval, you say the model is not good enough. If it doesn't, then you are not able to reject the hypothesis. So that is the overall um, test uh, structure that we have used. And we applied the similar structure to <coughs> total of five tests where you apply it without doing anything in a base case. And you can see that the result is 4.3% where there is some bias in, in, it is not able to predict exactly, but it is closer to 5% ab ability to reject the, the fitting. Then <clears throat> we applied the sample correction um, to the case test, wherein you are creating multiple samples of the known distributions and calculating KS distances. And you can see that it was virtually not able to reject any of the, um, any of the KS distances. And therefore we, in the third test, when you apply the corrections to the sampling error uh, using those first five, step, five steps, you can see that it is able to exactly reject up to 5% of the tests uh, where the distribution is not good enough. Now, when you apply the same tests without doing any correction for overlapping data to overlapping data problems, you can see that the rejection rate is much higher. Yeah, up to 44% of the tests it is rejecting it. And then you apply where the test data and the sample data both are overlapping and you make sure that it is on a consistent basis that you're using then you can see that we are getting back to 5.3%, which is closer to 5%. So Lilifer's adjustment does work uh, for both sample error correction as well as for the um, overlapping data problem. We have only tried the Gaussian processes here. We have not tried non-Levy stable processes uh, here. So conclusion may or may not be valid for uh, complex Levy processes. After doing the hypothesis testing, because hypothesis testing ultimately um, cannot describe whether the fitted distribution is a better distribution or not a better distribution, because it's just a yes or no answer. You have to have a broader view in terms of how my fitting of the distribution works throughout my empirical uh, data and overall the entire distribution. So can we see some alternatives where we can use some smarter ways of uh, utilizing the same data set to, to, to use that information. And the first thing that we tried was annualization transformation. Now in annualization transformation, the first step is that you take the monthly non-overlapping time series 
you try and fit a distribution to that at time series or you try there are various ways you do annualizations or you calculate those monthly changes and find out the correlations in the monthly time series so you calculate all the changes from let's say january to january february to february changes march changes and try and find out empirical correlations in that time series try and use a copula to make sure that you you create um, coherent distributions of those monthly time steps create large number of time steps and then go and calculate the annual changes from the data set and that is largely used approach and here you can use instead of gaussian copula another copula t copula but then you have to estimate an extra parameter to that which is which is a hard process and probably spuriously accurate as well so depending on how, what complexity that you are interested in you you try and measure it through a copula and then simulate the time series and based on that you can do the fitting of the distribution now that the key that has key advantages in terms of a you utilize all the information that is there in your data you are not missing any information number 2 you have created a large sample and therefore you you give this to any standard statistical package let's say r or sas or anything it will give you much better stable results and generally not errors at the same time because you have used a large sample of the data the stability of the calibration year on year is going to improve because there are 11 points you are adding to the process and therefore unless there is a massive crash or something like that the the results are going to be stable year on year through this process the key disadvantage is that again you are not avoiding autocorrelation and therefore the standard statistical tests or aic or bic criterion will not be valid uh, again for this a way of doing things we'll see some results here um, so this we have tried it on the credit risk ur30 is a merrill lynch single a index all terms on the left hand side uh, down below here <coughs> this is using the overlapping data and you can see that there is exponential decay very very gradual decay in the autocorrelation function similar aspect on the pca pscf partial autocorrelation function where it is sinusoidal and sometimes goes above the 5% line as well here again this these are the same data that we are using the acf here when you, you apply the transformation reduces suddenly and remains within the 5% range pscf again at the same time remains within the 5% range when you apply annualization process you compare the qq plots we have tried hyperbolic distribution here and you can see that in the tails if you use any uh, overlapping data as it is the tails are no good shape the body is good enough but tails are not good enough shape but here when you apply the annualization process you do get entire distribution that is reasonably good fit to your data now that is what we have seen uh, particularly for credit risk and we we just have shown here one index but we tried multiple indices uh, from merrill lynch uh, data set and similar observations we drew the second alternative and which is i think statistically uh, more complex uh, but credible approach is temporal aggregation because standard temporal aggregation formulas are available um, uh in in financial literature the main problem with doing temporal aggregation is that it becomes very complex uh, very easily so depending on what is your starting process or your high frequency process if it is a complex process then the low frequency process becomes even more complex and very quickly complex and it is very hard to head around those formulas and use those formulas in a in a bau setup where you have to churn out calibrations on a quarterly or a six monthly basis this example that we have we have done here is for equity risk where um you use the same monthly time series and keep on temporarily aggregate the time series and you can see that the stress values will be higher on the blue line which is the 12 month line as compared to any lower frequency line this is a feature of the way you do the temporal aggregation but this is through a formulaic approach uh, 
the key advantage of this is that you are using monthly annual non overlapping data and trying to aggregate those time series and therefore the standard statistical tests the aic the pic all those criteria are valid and you don't need to do any changes to that temporal aggregation <coughs> process because the number of transformations that are involved in doing temporal aggregation are materially more than any annualization process or even using standard processes of overlapping data are more and therefore you miss a lot of information in in between the transformations that are required to do temporal aggregation <clears throat> the key advantage of doing temporal aggregation that it does handle the data where volatility clustering problems are there or where a big event has happened and therefore similar big event is likely to happen such data sets it can handle very easily but as i said the complexity is the main problem in doing temporal aggregation because it is very hard to maintain these models that is what my personal experience i've i've, I've seen uh now comparing to the, the results here um we have used temporal aggregation here and this is based on equity data um that we have tried and you can see that for simple ar1 process um the calculation time itself in using a computer is around half a day uh, to do this sort of temporal aggregation approaches here on the left hand side both of these diagrams are just monthly annual overlapping time series and you can see that in the qq plots in the tails the fit is no good uh, particularly body the fit is okay but not in the tail um when you compare it with temporal aggregation approach you can see that the fit is is very good even even for the tails when compared to non um temporal aggregated time series now we can argue which one is more correct which one is not again it is an expert judgment and you need to convince the stakeholders uh, which approach is they believe in because um temporarily aggregate uh, aggregated time series generally underestimate the downside risk but overestimate the upside risks that is what we have seen both using the ar process and um using the gauge process as well that we will see in the next slide um now the same data set but using some sort of empirical gauge one one process that we have tried here um again you can see that the acf is materially improved when you do the temporal aggregation of the of the time series and in the body the results are very similar but in the tails um you get um lower quantiles but on the on the left hand side but on the right hand side you get very high quantiles if you use temporal aggregation time series in in terms of the summary i think we believe that there is a constant struggle between relevant data and longer data set and it is ultimately an expert judgment that is not avoidable uh we believe that the bias correction studies do help in terms of correcting the correcting for the bias but they directly or indirectly increases the variances of the time series and therefore can overestimate the the true quantiles um <clears throat> the mean squared error that that we have observed through our simulation study is that is lower for overlapping time series and therefore we believe that use of overlapping data is okay for doing the kind of work that we are trying to achieve where the data is limited and we are trying to come up with a 1 in 200 year type of calibration uh, approach um for solvency to purposes we have seen uh, possible solutions to uh, monthly annual overlapping data problem using annualization process and using the temporal aggregation process they both lead to materially improved fits uh, we believe whether we analyze acfs psfs qq plots um or actual uh, distances between the empirical data and the fitted uh, distribution and therefore you can say that they lead to more stability of the calibration also year on year that is what our observation is because we did try removing one years data or removing two years data and reperform the same activities that we tried but these both the methods whether you use um temporal aggregation or annualization process they both have their own problems in terms of complexity in terms of maintenance of the process <coughs> in terms of communication of the process temporal aggregation solves the issue of autocorrelation but um annualization process does not solve the problem of uh, autocorrelation in the data so those are our key conclusions that we have drawn from 
this uh, overlapping data study that we have carried out. Yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. And any questions you have, ready to take? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the presentation. Uh, so the discussion is now uh, open to the floor, and I'm certainly looking forward to a, an interesting and varied uh, debate. Um, I'd encourage both questions and comments, uh, because there may be things that uh, people would like to ask about the, clarify things about the paper or about the presentation. So uh, do feel free to ask questions as well as just comment. And uh, if, if you want to uh, make a contribution, could you use one of the microphones that are either down the middle or uh, at the side? And then please uh, clearly state your name uh, before uh, making your contribution. So if we go up here first. Uh, David Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much for the paper. Um, just one observation, I guess. Um, you, you talked about uh, the temporal aggregation approach, which means fitting a time series and projecting it forward and deriving the one-year distribution from that. Um, for these kind of models, there's a wealth of statistical goodness of fit tests. For the overlapping data problem, um, it seems to me that the volume of goodness of fit tests is really quite limited. Um, so you, you mentioned the Komogoros uh, Smirnoff test, uh, which has been adapted to deal with overlapping data. Um, however, my understanding is that at present the critical values that are available are based on uh, normal distributions and more work is required uh, to um, develop those tests to deal with the kind of typical NIG or EGB2 distributions that are, are used. I just wondered if you had uh, any, any comment on the robustness of the statistical tests for use on overlapping data, how those might be seen by the regulators or other stakeholders. Uh, and um, is, is it really, really just uh, the ease of communication um, that, that uh, is, is the, the driving factor in the choices? I think um, you identified the correct problem um, that is there for correcting any of the hypothesis testing. It is true that the tables are only available for standard processes like normal distribution. And if you are using complex distributions, like he mentioned, EGB2, four parameter or three parameter distributions, definitely you need to come up with your own standard tables. In a, in a BAU setup, when year on year, if you choose to change the distribution, that also means that you need to change your hypothesis testing standard tables, depending on what distribution you choose. And therefore, it is not uh, easy to maintain um, these sort of processes in, in, in regular day-to-day -day, uh, calibrator's life. Now, the, the key question that you asked is, um, what, do you, what do you do about it, um, these tests? I think these are there for communication purposes because my personal experience is that second line, sometimes they are hung on to seeing those hypothesis testing results. To, they have a list and they have to you know, strike through that list sometimes. And probably that is only for information purposes. As a calibrator, uh, as a practitioner, I don't think I have, um, I have used the results of these sort of tests to decide whether to select a distribution or not to select a distribution. Ultimately, um, we present our results through various uh, distributions and let an expert panel make a decision based on what fits well, uh, whether you are concentrating on the body of the distribution, overall distribution, tail of the distribution, and um, <clears throat> whether you look at QQ plots as more reasonable way of assessing the fit of the distribution, and whether you look at the stability of the calibrations year on year. So when you remove, let's say, three, four years of data and redo and reapply the same distributions that you've tried, which one is fitting well, you know, in, in comparison. So those sort of other way of other ways of 
assessing the goodness of it are I think more uh, practical than relying on standard statistical tests. I, mean, I could maybe just sort of add to that that um, just from sort of reading the paper and the, the presentation that the, one of the big advantages that we have now is that we don't really need to look up these old-fashioned paper tables that we can, as you did in the paper, you 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 can simulate the uh, uh, the distribution of the test statistic under a variety of models, and and of course that they're all going to produce different results, and it's really a case that you need to. to uh, really do enough repeated simulations in order to get a, a good sort of distribution at, at that 95% level. So, I mean, in the paper you mention uh, 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 using a, a thousand repeats, but is that really enough? <laughs> or should it be 10,000, say? It's not enough, definitely, 1,000. But um, on a standard desktops that we have, um, I think that was also very time consuming to do. But certainly 1,000 is not enough. If you are doing for a company in a proper setting, I think you better do at least 10,000 samples. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess that the, the 1,000 simulations, you can use that for a number of different models just to get a, 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 a first feel for which, 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 which is the preferred model, and then you can maybe do some uh, further yes. tests. Although I also get your point that uh, ultimately you don't place 100% of your faith just in that one test. I mean, there's a lot of other, uh, Patrick, maybe yes. slightly more subjective uh, elements that go into the discussion, so you should never just use one sort of numerical or quantitative uh, feature just to decide between models. Um, do we have another question or, or a comment? Uh, so, uh, just um, one of my, uh, my questions here. So, uh, so, a relatively simple one is uh, why did you choose cumulants rather than other properties of distributions in order to, uh, to do your fitting? Um, I think for fitting, we have used uh, both the approaches, method of moments as well as MLE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why we chose cumulants is because um, in our previous paper, Extremist Working Party paper, uh, on the EARSATS model, we did use cumulants. And um, theoretically, uh, we thought the central moment, instead of central moments, if we use cumulants, which are more uh, statistical evidence and statistical literature available um, on, on the subject, and therefore might be useful to it. And those are the two reasons why we started with cumulants, actually. Mm -hmm. We could have used alternatively the moments, and the results would not, the conclusions wouldn't have differed materially either way. Is the topic too technical or <laughs> people are shy about it or I'm not sure. Hi, Craig Turnbull. Um, thanks again for the paper and the talk, very interesting. Um, I kind of come to this with a sort of reflex scepticism that overlapping data can tell us anything new um, that's not already in the, the non-overlapping information. And to help me sort of explore that logic a little bit and, and, and your argument here for, for, for why we should use um, the overlapping data could be, so maybe sort of, if you like, take this logic to the limiting place. So let's suppose we're dealing with, say, equity returns on the FTSE, something where there's lots of data available. And so in the examples you've gave, we've used, looked at monthly returns, but clearly for um, a, uh, an asset like that, um, we'll have time series data that could be available um, daily, hourly, by the minute, perhaps now even, even more frequently than that. Um, so I guess the question I'd, I'd like to understand the answer to and the, the explanation for is, if there was, you know, say, minute by minute returns available, would you advocate using that in estimating the one year distribution? And if so, why? If not, why not? <laughs> 
We did consider this question, um, but we have not explored it practically, so I won't be able to tell you that the results of this are these. <clears throat> but in terms of practice, when we explored through various firms in which we all work, and what we saw is that monthly data is, is what people are using as the most high frequency data, not daily data on any of the market risks so far. But I don't see any reason why we can't use them. Uh, but I cannot tell you upfront what would the results entail. But from the theoretical discussion and from the work that we have done so far, I believe that the more high frequency the data you use and the more, the more number of transformations that are required because from daily data or from let's say every minute data, you need to convert it into hourly or higher frequency or lower frequency data overall you are doing many more transformations in the process and therefore you will lose information at every stage of the transformation. And therefore, the balance that we need to stick to is whether the loss of information at every transformation is more or whether the information that is gained by going into lower uh, high frequency data is more. So I think it's a, I think unless we do the analysis, we won't know right now. Uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, was, uh, say, looking at the credit data, was that you, you have the big shock in uh, 2008. Uh, and I guess a challenge there is that, that that's one big event that, ha say, happened over 20, 30 years. And so um, the, the, that, num that 30 years or whatever is make, going to make a big difference to the implied frequency of that type of event. So do you have any sort of comments in terms of how that might play out in terms of the methodology? Um, or is there, indeed, is there any method that could actually <laughs> really do a good job of capturing what, what the chances of a similar thing happening are in the future? Well, I would like to learn that method, but so far we don't know whether <laughs> there is any method or not that can predict or that can accommodate 2008-type crisis. Now, my experience is slightly varied on this subject, actually. So before, uh, let's say, 2010 in my job, we used to say that, or we were allowed to say that 2008 type of an event is more than one in 200 year event. You know, it is a one in 250 or 300 year event. But then by the time European crisis, sovereign crisis happened, um, and therefore, we all had to change our belief and say that, you know, we had to convince ourselves that these, these sort of events can happen in less than one in 200 year event and therefore has to be part of one in 200 year calibration. Mm -hmm. So that is, a, that is a big shift I think we, we all observed. And we used to previously argue that that was a default crisis, this is a liquidity crisis and therefore we have to look at different way and different aspects are forcing, different forces are affecting both of them. But as I said, for credit risk, the data is very, very scanty, I would say. And the 2008 event is such a large event that probably no distribution that I have seen fits well. You can't compare equity data versus credit data. Uh, because the market structure is totally different. Uh, the, the way credit is seen is different. The way ratings are assigned are, are, are constantly changing. And after 2008-9 event, I think rating agencies were forced to change their approach to provide rating and the, and the transition ratings and things like that. So there's a whole host of different um, uh, arena in which we are working these days. Is there anybody in the audience that could comment on or make a comment on how they use uh, or, or deal with that particular period of data? Patrick Alhara, yeah, just, um, I think actually just on the credit data, I think um, the actual data itself, I think if you were to look at uh, the Merrill Lynch data that, that obviously the working part considered and something like IBOX, I think there are significant differences. And there's like, in terms of how the, the actual, um, this is one problem with the actual data itself is that the actual prices that were quoted back then there wasn't a huge amount of credibility in them, obviously, so there, you know, you have that, that particular problem as well. Um, I just wanted to make a question as well, uh, if I may. 
Uh, once again, thanks very much, Garang, for a fantastic paper. Um, but just, just, to, uh, just to just clear my understanding, would it be fair to say that um, for, for non-overlapping data, once you made that n minus 1 correction, that there isn't bias in, this, in, in the variance, but there is a much larger degree of error compared to no overlapping data where there is a bias, but there's much slow, lower error. Is, is that a fair assessment? Fair. A, this is practically a fair conclusion mm -hmm. uh, about that. And that is because the sample size in, in the non-overlapping data is materially smaller uh, as compared to the sample size that you get in the overlapping data. And therefore, for a known distribution, when you start with, you get lower uh, mean squared error for overlapping data. And I think the first thing that you highlighted about credit risk, now credit risk is a, is a problem in multiple dimensions. First of all, <clears throat> if you look at the three most commonly used data sources, one is Moody's data source, one is Merrill Lynch data source, and one is iBox data source that are widely used. Now Moody's data source, if you look at, it is mainly based on US data, from 1919 onwards. Um, not 100% uh, nice data to work with in my practical experience, and not directly relevant to the UK experience that we are generally uh, trying to um, calibrate it to. At the same time, that is more of a default crisis and railways data, the industries were totally different in that, in that, uh, in that era. And therefore, uh, granularity is also not available in terms of financials, non-financials, term dimension is not there, only rating dimension is there. And therefore, people who are using Moody's data, I have seen them correcting their stress or uh, adapting their stresses to more relevant data sets. Now, as Patrick said, iBox data and Merrill data also differ in terms of the level of granularity that is available. Both of them have rating and term dimensions, but not industry dimensions, so for example, um, Eco automobile industries or, for example, utility industries, that level of granularity is not available in certain data sets. And therefore, uh, the prices or the conclusion sometimes you get, if you're using index-based calibration, you might get slight differences uh, using either of the data series as well. Also, not all the data sets, sets have all the risk measures. So sometimes iBox, for example, I don't think it has got the option adjusted spread data that is available. Only Merrill Lynch has option adjusted spread data. So credit, uh, I think the data is not generalized data that is available and or not standardized data I would say that is available uh, for credit risk. And that, that worsens the problem for calibrators. Um, if I could come back to the sort of higher frequency data, because that was certainly something that I was going through my mind, and uh, uh, Craig mentioned that as well, that um, if, just as a sort of simple starting point, if you had IID data, then clearly higher frequency will get you better estimates of some parameters, not, not all of them, um, and particularly in the, uh, the variance is one that with the Brownian motion, that the more data the higher frequency, the better uh, uh, estimates that you get. So is, is that something that is generally true when you go to models where there is more autocorrelation, or is that, uh, or indeed when you go to, the, you've maybe got IID data, but you, when you look at the other cumulants, do they also become more accurate? Um, we have only seen or experimented with the standard equity set, credit sets, interest rate sets. We have not seen materially uh, higher autocorrelated data, so mm. don't know about that. But practically speaking, lower frequency, like for example, high frequency data that you're using um, has better chances of getting it to the right answer than using lower frequency data, yeah. so is what we, are, we have observed mm -hmm. um, so far. But it is really a case of, uh, if, as was mentioned, if you use weekly or daily data, would you uh, really get very substantially better results or would you just get a little bit better than you've managed so far with the I think, I overlapping think data? The key balance that we need to strike is that how much information you are going to lose when you use uh, uh, very high frequency data to convert that into low frequency data mm -hmm. with the amount of information that you are gaining for going into more granular data. So 
it depends on how many parameters you are estimating throughout the process and what sort of degrees of freedom you are losing on the way uh, as well. Mm -hmm. But if you are using simple models and let's say number of parameters that you are estimating at every transformation stage are, are few or virtually using empirical uh, data set itself, probably you might get better results for using uh, higher frequency data. Any other questions or comments? We've still got plenty of time. So. <laughs> yep. Uh, Roddy McPherson, hi, good evening. Uh, I just wondered whether, I mean, it sounds like you're uh, looking at maybe equity returns in nominal terms, and I just wondered um, is there any benefit in looking at things in real, real terms, especially if you're considering a much longer period of time? I mean, obviously in the UK we've had, maybe we've been targeting inflation at 2% uh, maybe over the last, I don't know, 20 years, let's say. But if we are looking at much longer data, data sets, then would, you know, is there any merit in bringing in inflation into, into things? Um. We have used total returns, but still you can say they are all nominal returns that we have used. Uh, we have not corrected them for inflation, um, inflation time series over a period of time. And the key issue that we considered was that to correct that for inflation over a period of time itself is a separate time series. So inflation risk itself is a time series that you need to first of all model, and therefore model risk you carry in, in, in estimating inflation time series itself. And therefore, by correcting that for inflation purposes, we might introduce some sort of model error as well and parameter error as well. Mm -hmm. So we have not tried it, but certainly it's a good point to, to take away and think about it. What conclusions would we get if we corrected it for the inflation? But the one thing that we have done uh, to ensure is that we have corrected it for the historical mean of the data. So therefore, let's say 1970s where we had 10% or 11% equity returns, and very high interest rates as well, we have removed the mean of the historical mean from the data to ensure that the bias is not there. But whether it will impact on any other cumulant or not, uh, we have not tested it. Yeah, but following up on that, is that when you say you're taking out the historical mean, is that taken as a constant over the whole period or is it off? Uh, yeah, it, it is a constant that um, you take it out from the yeah. entire series, and therefore when you when you demean the time series, mm -hmm. the mean of that time series that is demeaned is virtually zero. Yeah, because I, I guess a sort of variation on the comment could be that uh, I mean that there's certainly you mentioned a model error, but there's a, a, a model choice in terms of using nominal returns. So you could equally with the historical data either look at the um, the, the real returns, or you could po possibly also look at uh, um, uh, equity returns or whatever in excess of the risk-free rate of interest, just as, as a, a further variant. Yes, so I think um, the analysis that we have done is always in excess of risk-free itself, and the spread data that right. we have used is option-adjusted spread, so it is over the swap rate or guilt rate, whichever country you're using it for. Mm -hmm. So definitely it is demeaned and uh, uh, over and above the risk-free data. But as you said, that um, it is not, um, it is still nominal uh, mm. data that we have used, mm. not inflation corrected or inflation adjusted data. Yeah, yeah. I guess it very much depends on the particular time series or, or data set that you're looking at as to the relevance there. But there's certainly, you know, the, the, the methods I, I assume could be very easily adapted to. Yes extract one thing or, or, or not. So, it, well, it looks to me like we've uh, sort of run out of questions, so uh, I, don't, I don't need to, I don't really want to sort of keep going to the bitter end at seven o'clock. So um, I'll just sort of uh, briefly try to uh, uh, summarize. So we've had, uh, first of all, a sort of very, uh, good presentation from Gorang, and then uh, 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 a few questions. So David Stevenson was talking about the uh, tests for the, the different approaches, and that the, these might be a bit limited, but then the, the, I think the, the, 
the, the point there is that we are, with computing power, that we, we can be very much more adaptable, but, but equally we also need to be just mindful that uh, the formal test results are just one part of a model selection criterion and that uh, so long as you're not miles above or below our critical threshold, then that there are other things that you might want to think about. Uh, Craig Turnbull talked about the frequency of the data, so should it just be monthly or should we use uh, uh, even higher frequency uh, data? And certainly high frequency data to me would certainly mean more, more frequent than daily rather than uh, uh, monthly. But, um, but there's certainly there are plenty of issues there and that, that, that also links to uh, whether you want to go down this route of, route of using the uh, overlapping data versus a full, full blown stochastic model. Uh, we had a bit of discussion about the, uh, the sort of credibility in the, the uh, 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 credit data from uh, Patrick Kelleher and a, bit, a little bit of discussion there around the, um, uh, the the credit crunch and how that has impacted or how that might impact on the types of analysis and then uh, lastly we had some uh, comments about how you might adjust the data before you put it through the uh, 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 modeling process from uh, Roddy McPherson in terms of should we use nominal or real returns or returns that are in excess of uh, 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 the, the risk-free rate. And of course, there are other data sets uh, where you're maybe looking at credit spreads and other things where it's not returns that you're looking at, but it's maybe other uh, sorts of issues. So uh, finally, it uh, just remains for me to express my own thanks, and I'm sure the thanks of everybody here to the, 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 the authors generally, so most of whom are not here. Uh, but uh, in particular, uh, uh, Gorang for his presentation uh, tonight and also his uh, 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 thorough sort of discussion and responses to the questions that uh, have come up. Um, uh, and then finally, it would be sort of very useful for those of you who um, participated in the discussion for, and in, in our pre uh, preparation of the transcript for the British Actuarial Journal that uh, if you do have any uh, sort of pre-prepared notes, uh, then uh, please let the events team uh, sitting here at the, the front of the hall um, uh, do pass them on. Uh, but equally, if, if you don't have that, then um, you, as you uh, reg certainly regular contributors will know that you'll receive an email in due course with your uh, uh, a, a transcriber's attempts at you, what it was that you said, minus all the ums and ahs. Um, and so uh, with that, I think that's the uh, end of the evening. So thank you. Thank you.